Welcome to Shaping the Future. In this episode, I speak with Professor Kevin Anderson, who is the former director of the UK's Tyndale Centre for Climate Change Research and an expert in policy and energy. He is also a part time professor at the University of Uppsala in Sweden and even squeezes in a day a week at a university in Norway. In this episode, we discuss who are the culprits of climate action failure, how coronavirus has shown us we are all equal in society, and how solving current inequality is an essential component of solving the climate crisis. In the next episode in the series, I will be speaking to Professor Jason Box from the Geological Survey of Denmark. Jason is a Greenland ice sheet expert and is going to share his insights into the changes happening in Greenland and the impact this could have on the overall climate system. Please do consider subscribing to the podcast on whatever channel you use. Shaping the Future is based on a series of conversations with thought leaders who are really attempting to look past the pandemic period and see how our choices can help shape a better future, possibly one better than we imagined previously. I'm going to start with, given that this was a year when the UK was going to be holding the UN COP, and it's five years on from the Paris Agreement, were you optimistic pre-pandemic that COP26 was going to deliver a good result in terms of tackling the climate crisis? Well, that's a quite a simple two-letter answer. No, I wasn't optimistic at all. I don't see myself really as an optimist or a pessimist. I think I just look at what's around me and try and make my best judgment of from that um, and I try not to really have a lot of pessimism or optimism within that mm. um, but I had no I had no real set of reasons to suggest that we'd be in any way moving more towards the Paris uh, commitments um, and when every year we move further away from them and every year that we move further away from them it's harder to move back towards them because the budget gets smaller and smaller so I, I, I expected that this year the level of rhetoric would have been ramped up and the UK is a particularly good country at rhetoric. So I think that we would have really put on a good show in some respects and, and it might have looked really quite upbeat. We might have left um, the event in Glasgow with our shoulders high and feeling positive about the future, but I think quick, quite quickly would have reflected that it was uh, another empty event. But do you think, given that the UK is also quite a good place for activism in in certain ways Mm -hmm. there was talk about a sort of a parallel civil society cop and i thought that was that was quite an interesting dynamic Mm -hmm. i I get what you're saying about the actual real outcomes of the political side but on the social side do you think that could have been quite an interesting dynamic yes now whether it came out to play in uh, um in in glasgow in the cop or not i don't know but uh, certainly i think that the last year and a half I mean, the first time in probably a decade, probably a decade, maybe slightly more than that now, that I've had seen any real positive sign that we may, we may change direction significantly. And whilst I think that should have been led, significantly fed into and potentially le- even led by some sort of, you know, by the academics addressing issues of mitigation. And I want to draw a clear distinction here between academics looking at the climate science and academics looking at what we have to do in terms of reducing our emissions. On the climate science, I think the academics have done a good job in terms of um, in what we have to do about it. I think collectively, at least, we've been, uh, we've, been we've led on mitigation denial. So I think we have, so we have failed, and and so the journalists, so the journalists who haven't probed us, haven't probed the policymakers, haven't probed a lot of the co-op to the end of the NGOs, the senior people in the NGOs across the board, the people who should have done something and should have led, have failed, and have actually chosen to fail as well. Um, collect- collectively, there have been some exceptions within that, but collectively. Mm-hmm. And so I've been quite depressed by that. But actually, this social movement, or this civil society, this civil society movements, because that's another thing I like about it, it's quite eclectic, quite a mixed bag of people. I think that has been really very positive. And what I find quite uplifting is that they have changed the tenor of the debate, importantly changed it. And one way of looking at this is that the, the Committee on Climate Change had its net zero report that came out quite recently, or I, as I prefer to call it, not zero. Um, and I think it's a really problematic report in lots of respects. And when it first came out, it, it looked almost like, at least, at least the way the press put it across and a lot of, a lot of academics, isn't this a, a great you know, move forward? And yet very quickly, it's, it looks to me like something out of the 1990s because of the, because of the change in agenda that the civil society groups 
in various forms have pushed through. And that's been played out regionally in terms of things like some of the mayors and so forth, talking about 2030, 2035 and so yeah. forth. So, so whilst the, the Committee on Climate Change and a whole load of well-paid professors have bang on about net zero or not zero in 2050, what we're actually seeing is a, is a debate in civil society and some correspondent change within local and regional government along a 2030, 2035 sort of time frame, and not really about net zero, but about real zero. And that, I think, has been quite uplifting. Now, that's not saying that there's any real discussion about how we're going to deliver on that, but there is a recognition that the agenda is not the one that has been set by the centre. Okay. There has been a sort of reported rise in climate anxiety, if you want to call it that, among civil society. And it's hard these days not to notice Australia on fire, the Amazon on fire, these huge carving events in Antarctica and, you know, the, the, the loss of Arctic sea ice and so on and so forth. Do you think that's feeding into this galvanised new movement or do you think it's, it's just picking up the failures of the last decade? What do you think is really driving it? Because the point I make is that it's, it's spreading. It is, and I don't think... I mean, other people will know about this much, much more than I would. But to me, I see it very much more of a, as an emergent outcome of the system. I don't think there's a particular drive for it. And we always, we always like to find these. We always, it's a very sort of reductionist approach that we, that as engineers, of course, we love. And, and, and I'm not opposed to reductionism. It's been phenomenally successful since the sort of enlightenment onwards and the industrial revolution onwards. But it also comes with lots of problems. Um, and I think also we start to think that every problem can be resolved by reductionist thinking. Um, and so we're trying to find who, who's the key person that brought this about, the key driver. I think there's a whole suite of drivers uh, and they play out differently with different, con different constituencies, different people, different cultures. And so I think looking for single ones is difficult. But certainly what we've seen, what we've witnessed in terms of what appears to be changes that have come about, like the Australian fires and so forth, either aligned with the changes we would expect from ongoing climate change or may well sometimes even be able to identify some signal in there from climate change. That has, that has helped in that, in that emergent process, along with a whole suite of other things that have, that have gone on there as well. I was just wondering, previously there's always been a lot of debate about how we frame this issue and you, we can't be too bleak, we can't be too optimistic, you know. And when things arise like Australia, which was just so visual and, you know, very visceral at the same time, mm. it, do those things just start feeding into the narrative in, in a way that it's like, bloody hell, you know, that's real? Yeah, it, it does. But we also, we're quite careful about that. We also saw that in Sandy and things like that as well. And often, what, as I understand it, it's not something I've ever worked on, but academics have looked at this. What you see at first is a, is a rising concern, and then quite quickly that fades away. And then if you get other events, sometimes they don't come back again, that, that concern. You, get, you then normalise these things happening. So yeah. I think we, I've never liked the idea what we have to do is to, is to wait for, rely on nature hitting us back and saying, look, here, you stupid species, get, you know, get your act together. Um, I, don't, I think it's a very unhelpful way of thinking of these things. Um, and also, I think as, as, as an academic, as a, as, you know, as a scientist as it's in the scientific community, we have to not overplay those things either. I don't think we should be ever looking to, looking to use something or misuse something in some sort of Machiavellian way to mm -hmm. get, our, get our way one way or another. It is absolutely a requirement on us to, to do our analysis and um, you know, carefully and cogently and robustly and not and not manipulate things to bring about um, answers or changes that we may want to see personally. I think it's, we have to be very careful about that. And I think that is just different to NGOs. It's even different to policymakers. They're trying to bring about delivery of an outcome, and we're trying to inform a process where we determine what sort of outcomes we may want. But I think the actual choice of the outcomes and even of the actions is, not, is something that academics feed into. And as a community, we should just be informing that debate. As citizens, as individuals, we may have a preference of it going one way or another. And that's a very difficult and messy distinction to make, but I think it is very important. Otherwise, we are just going to be acting as activists. And I don't, it's interesting this, this whole, I'm, perhaps I'm going off topic here, but a lot of people argue as academics that, a lot, that we shouldn't be activists. And other, I know some other um, academics who think, no, we should be on issues like climate change, it becomes so important. And whilst as individuals, I think we can be activists, I think as academics, the only activism we have to have is, to, is for us to remain um, robust academics. 
And my concern is that a lot of the robust academics on climate change haven't been robust. Actually, what they've been is activists because they've been supporting the status quo. They've massaged their assumptions to support the status quo. They'll, you know, so there's, there's almost like a, a quiet activism that's gone on there. It, or they've just stayed quiet when other people have misused the science one way yes. or another. And all of that to me is activism. And actually, the, often the voices from the climate realm, climate academic realm, who are then accused of being activists, I think often aren't. They're just being academics. And they've been academics who talk vociferously about what their work is telling them. And that is our role. Now, whether, I don't think we should call it activism. I think that you know, supporting the status quo when our research shows otherwise, that is activism and it's very dangerous because it, it, it masquerades, it hides behind a veil of objectivity. And do you think that supports the failure you were alluding to at the beginning? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And, I, and I, let's say, also, when I'm, because I'm being quite critical here of my own community because it's the community I know best. Um, I, I, I think it is driven mostly by the senior people in our, who have been undertaking um, or overseeing a lot of the research. The earlier career researchers, the PhDs and other colleagues, um, often are much more robust and much more uneasy with the deliberate manipulation of our assumptions to give convenient answers or by the silence that we often have. Um, so I, I'm, not, you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say all senior academics uh, have been co-opted on issues of mitigation. But I think that, that collectively we have failed at a, a fairly fundamental level and that we've also imposed that failure on, because we like hierarchical systems, we've imposed that failure on some of the earlier career researchers, but they are starting to have their voices heard. Not least helped, I think, by some of the youth movements that have given them some sort of framework and confidence to stand up and say what they judge is appropriate from their work. And do you think, it, in, in some senses, the social side of it, the civil side of it, is the, almost the third leg in that stool? Because the policymakers like public at, uh, appetite before they, they come out with policies they think are you know, re-electable. If you yeah, know. With, without, that, I mean, without a doubt, there's an there's a absolute key role for society in here, for civil society. And I don't mean in, it, it all has to be in some sort of unified, neat form. I mean, the, the messy relationship between, within civil, civil societies and between civil society and policymakers, the bottom up and the top down, that, these things are all messy relationships. Um, but they're all, they're all important. I mean, we can't just rely on, you know, on the government, on the law, on the academics, the journalists. They, 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 I mean, collectively, they have failed, um, mm-hmm. along with, along with um, you know, deliberate undermining of the issues by some very important uh, um, companies in, our, in, you know, in this debate of the fossil fuel companies, typically. Uh, civil society have, uh, need to have a very strong voice in that. And I think at last they have had a voice. And in fact, disturbingly, they had the voice that has changed, as I said before, changed the tenor of the debate. Okay. Now, one of the things that's come out of this whole lockdown phase, and it's a global lockdown, is, is less of demand on some forms of consumption. And one of those is transport, and subsequently oil has suffered. Do you have thoughts, because you're an energy expert yeah. do you have thoughts on the impact of this whole oil scenario on the climate side of things yeah well it's something i've thought about a lot i don't think it's very easy to say where we're going to go next and, and sort of optimists see this as a really positive sign and pessimists sort of turn around and say well it's hardly, hardly made any difference to the, to the co2 concentrations and of course ultimately the the climate cares about the amount of co2 in the atmosphere the co2 concentration and we're not the concentration is not going to come down because of covid19 let's be clear the concentration will go up with COVID-19 because okay we've reduced the amount of emissions but those emissions just add to what we put out last year so there is going to be more CO2 in the atmosphere after a COVID year after a COVID decade there'll be more CO2 in the atmosphere than there was before so Mm -hmm. we are not reducing the CO2 concentration all we have done is very 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 slightly increased the rate of increase in climate change Okay. So we, so we slightly, we very slightly reduced the rate of increase. Um, so I think we have to bear that in mind. You know, we, you know, slightly reducing our emissions, even reducing our emissions by 10 or 15% as a one-off is, is pretty irrelevant from a climate perspective. Now, whether that plays out in terms of us um, changing the way that, that, that our consumer society operates and therefore the amount of fossil fuels we combust is something that is a matter of choice for us. It isn't set in stone, it's gonna go one way or another. We're not trying to predict something that is already set in stone. We have a choice to whether, it, whether we learn lessons from this or um, in terms of our emissions, 
or whether we do not. Now, I, I don't think that, I think the jury's out on that at the moment. Which way we go on that? Certainly, there'll be there'll be some minor adjustments here and there that we're going to we that will definitely have learned some things. But whether we play that out as a more fundamental shift in the framing of our society that has meant that our levels of consumption um, have led to this huge increase in, in CO two emissions and fossil fuel use, but in addition, um, you know, big reductions in biodiversity and all the other sustainability implications. Yeah. Whether we learn lessons from this, I think uh, the, the jury is out. But it is up to us if we want to bring if we want to put those lessons into practice, is that we have to, we have to fight and argue for that. As someone who's, who's given up flying for a long time and criticise, again, your own community of, of academics who fly when they don't necessarily need to for, for whatever reason, everyone's been forced into this medium which we're using now. Do you think that the, that will stick? Do you, have you got your optimistic about that? Well, um... <laughs> really, <laughs> really, really, really. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, undoubtedly I think a lot of people will look at this and think this, this works really well it's a damn sight easier to do this sometimes but it doesn't come with prestige mm. I think we, we have to recognise one of the reasons that people flew and actually when you look at it who flew primarily I think the research that's been undertaken by some of the people in Cardiff and elsewhere has shown that you know, the people that fly the most are the senior people um, and they're sometimes even flying business class. But they're, the, they're the ones that have had the, even the greatest increases have been amongst the senior academics. It's also to be clear that typically senior academics have less innovative thinking, innovative thoughts than the younger academics because we're locked more into the baggage. So one of the reasons we've been flying around the world is we love the prestige. We like the idea that someone, and it's not something that's, this is necessarily explicitly thought through, but that sense that someone has asked us, someone important high up somewhere has asked us to go somewhere they're going to pay us to go. They're going to pay for our hotel, our taxis. We never use buses. Our taxis. Right? So they're going to pay for all of that. That says something about I'm an important person. Now, we don't get that from, from, from this virtual conferencing lark. So whilst I think when we really want to engage, genuinely want to engage, this virtual conferencing is really very useful in, in, a mm. various, in its various guises. What it doesn't do, it doesn't massage our egos. It doesn't help us increase our prestige and and, and make us feel better than those people around us. And, and so there's, there was a real risk that to get that, we'll return to what we had before. And in fact, you could argue it would be even, even more. Oh, no, I didn't use virtual conferencing. I flew there by, in you know, my plane or whatever to, to do something. And therefore, I must be important because the rest of you are having a virtual conference. So overall, yes, I think it, will show, it should show some improvement. But we have to be very careful again not to see this sort of kickback um, to, to, to why we did things before. So all of these things, what I'm saying, that all of these things are there for us to, um, to play out in a more positive direction if we, if we want them to. But it, we can't just sit back on our laurels and assume that that will naturally happen. I think it will require some active input. Okay. So if I put my um, seatbelt and crash helmet on, should I ask you about bailouts for airlines? <laughs> Um, I, 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 firstly, I don't, I, it's not the airlines I'm concerned about particularly. I, you know, I do not want to bail out some bearded parasite from his Caribbean island. Um, I, I'm, not interested in, I'm, not, I'm not in the slightest interested in people like him, but I'm interested in some of the people that are employed in the airlines. So, that, so you know, decent human beings are employed in the airlines and the oil and gas industry and the coal industry. So if, if we are going to think about anyone, it is, it is, it is their uh, wherewithal, their well-being, their, you know, their quality of life that I'm concerned about. I'm not interested in the people that own these companies or the very senior people in these companies at all. Um, and so I think if we are going to use any forms of bailout, then we have to make sure that it's, it's tailored to those particular people. And we should also ensure that they are in any way, if they are to be used in any form, they are used in a way that can help us deliver on other objectives. Right. So, so for instance, if you are bailing out, the, I'm not saying exactly how you should do this, but perhaps if we are going to bail out the airlines because we are concerned about the employees. We take the shares in those companies. Um, and we have some control in those companies. Then we can start to move those companies to become travel companies or, you know, or service companies away from being just making their money by flogging more and more airline tickets. So, and it's the same with all companies, move, maybe move them towards being energy companies. So I think we have to, and I think we've, we lost the opportunity with the banks. We, you know, we should have, we should take all the shares off the banks and then we should have operated the banks. I mean, I don't personally, I think banks should have been nationalized years ago. Um, but, but, and I don't think we should nationalize lots of things, but I think banks are one of those things that it's a very clear service. And I think with some of these things, we could, we, we, if we are going to put public money, taxpayers' money into these private entities, then we need to make sure these private entities broadly move and fulfill wider requirements of society. Okay. 
we talked a minute ago about the fires in the Amazon and all these sort of visual things that are starting to transpire. And this year is expected to be the warmest on record, I think I read somewhere. Well, every, 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 every year is the warmest on record or one of the last 10 years is warmest on the record. Yeah, I mean, there is absolutely no doubt we are, in, in any way, shape or form, that, that, that we understand science, there is no doubt what we are living through is human-induced anthropogenic climate change. Yeah, and it's putting us at risk, it's putting other species at risk, and that risk is just, it's growing, but now it's, it seems to be in the here and now and not so much about a future thing. Um, it, is a, it is very much a future thing, but it, we are living in it. You know, yeah, we, 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 are, we are living it, and we have been living it for quite a long time. Um, we are getting better at observing things around us, and I think, so again, as I said at the beginning, we have to be very careful in this idea of attribution. Yeah. So I think it's, it's not unreasonable for the NGOs to use these things or the policymakers to use them as indicative of the changes we expect to see. Um, but I think as, as the academic community, we have to not overplay what we can say about these things. But it does look, from the academic research that's been undertaken, my understanding of that research, is that there is greater ability to a- attribute these events, some of the events we're seeing, to climate change. That does seem to be happening. So okay. um, we are witnessing these things, and it looks like our science can say, yes, these are good signs of, well, bad signs of, uh, of our impact. And, okay, well, and I wanted to tie that to the, to the whole timeline along this sort of 2050, I don't want to call it a target, but, you know, it is a kind of target in a way. We want to reduce our emissions to zero by 2050. Can yeah, we, can I'm, we... I'm not sure I'd even agree with that. Do we really want to reduce our emissions to zero by 2050? I mean, 2050 is, an, is, a, is, is some sort of approach we have adopted which basically means we'll be retired we'll have done very well out the system today we haven't got make large major changes today um and you know it's sufficiently far in the future for us to just carry on with a incrementally greenwashed business as usual i don't think there's necessarily a great desire to reduce our emissions by 2050 um it's fraudulent in in lots of in, in lots and so many respects i have to say is there a way, and well, I found it quite interesting with, with David King creating his independent sage, and so is there a way for us to sort of, again, it's going back a bit to the first question about collectively or, or doing something either nationally or globally to accelerate our response beyond the systems which, aren't, like the UNFCCC process, for example, that doesn't seem to be delivering on, <laughs> you know, what we need. It does seem, seem like we need new thinking in, in some aspects. And I'm just trying to think, is there a way that we can, is there a, a view of a considered a, a way around this issue? I don't think there's a neat top-down way around this issue. As I said, I think earlier, but I think there is, a, there is and there always has been some sort of in, uh, inevitably messy process, and rightly messy process, between bottom-up and top-down. It is, a, it is a, um, uh, an ongoing, evolving partnership, and it always has been in one form or another. Um, but I think if we're relying on some sort of top-down initiative from the great and good in our society to come up with some whiz-bang sort of framework that's going to get us to where we need to be in terms of delivering on our, and approaching our Paris commitments, I think we're going to fail. Mm-hmm. So, it, so therefore, it is incumbent on wider society to engage in this debate rather than just wait for others. Um, do I think it's, it's achievable? I don't think 1.5 is achievable um, unless negative emission technologies play out, are, are successful at the scale that's embedded in some of the models. and and we actually mitigate for two degrees centigrade. We are real mitigation, not, not negative emission technology type mitigation. So if we do everything we can for a sort of carbon budget around two degrees centigrade and the negative emissions work, then maybe one and a half has got some sort of theoretical chance. Mm-hmm. I think we're pushing on the, we're, we're probably going to fail on two, but I think two is just about feasible still. But it will require some fundamental, well, it does require some fundamental profound changes to contemporary society. But let's be clear, those fundamental profound changes are not to everyone in society. They are to those of us who are responsible for the lion's share of the emissions. And there is increasing evidence. There's a new paper by Anne Owen and um, Julia Steinberger, and a very sad, I can't remember the third person from Leeds looking at this in, in Nature Energy, showing how the emissions are hugely skewed towards this particular group of people. There's the Chance and Piketty work, there's Dario Kennel's work. There's a whole suite of work out there that shows where we know what activities bring about the emissions. And those activities are the responsibility of a small group of the population at the global level and even in countries that are highly unequal like the UK. So we are not going to resolve the problem unless that particular group, uh, and let's be brutally honest about it, they're not going to do it voluntarily. 
are in mm-hmm. some form or other forced probably by regulation to change what it is that they do, what it is they aspire to, how they operate their lives. Um, and we will fail on anything like the Paris Agreement unless we can bring that about. And that in itself won't be sufficient. We also need the big, um, you know, sort of the FDR, if you like, the, the, the New Deal, a Green New Deal, re, you know, returning to Roosevelt's fireside chats back in the 1930s, that sort mm-hmm. of rethinking the world type think, um, thinking. That's also important from a physical infrastructural point of view. But that, ha- that will need to go along, these profound changes in this deeply unequal society. Because that, whether we think the deeply unequal society is a good or a bad thing or we're indifferent about it, what it does do, it shows us the emissions come from particular groups. But do you think that in this crisis we're in now, for example, it's that group, and I would say you know, probably I'm in that group, you know, it's that group that have not really been impacted. That much. I mean, there's a lot of people in society who are really not having a good time at the moment for various reasons. And it's people like, and as I just said, people like me who actually have not been hurt too much at all and I'm carrying on as normal. I have a pretty nice quality of life. But I've been given a lot of existential thinking space. And I think a lot of people have because of, there's no traffic jam in our street like there normally is at five o'clock in the afternoon you know there's a lot of things that we we quite like this there's no planes flying into the airports make drown out the noise of the birds you know the sound of the birds and do you think this is an opportunity whether it's sees or not isn't a different thing but yeah oh absolutely this is an opportunity and and i mean actually there are some parallels i think in terms of in relation to climate change what we've seen with covid19 it is at least within the UK, and I'm sure this is true for many other parts of the world, it, it has highlighted the absolute depth of inequality in our society. Um, we see, and we, or we hear and see every Thursday evening in the UK, and you see this in other parts of the world, when people go out and clap and say how wonderful the NHS is, NHS is and, and the carers and the, the, you know, and the truck drivers and the bus drivers, who have had a disproportionate number of people dying who are bus drivers in the UK. So the people at the forefront of our response to climate change often are those that are, are the least rewarded or are low, mm-hmm. very, uh, very low salaries and you know, zero hour contracts and, and no job security. Not all of them, but many of them are like that. So, and these people are at the forefront of, of, of addressing these issues that we face today and, and all the risks that are there. And what do we do? We clap for them. We don't pay them more. Why are they not paid like professors? Why, you know, why do we still celebrate the re smogs, the hedge fund managers of the world? We, I think how wonderful it is when a football player goes from 3 million a year to 2 million a year, an utter disgrace. So the obscenity of our inequality is there brutally you know, revealed in front of us, and yet we, we're doing nothing about it. We're still clapping the great and good when they say something about the health service. When we, when we see these stars on television trying to get normal people to donate towards something to help with the NHS, rather than saying, well, no, hang on, why are you paid? 200,000 to a million pound a year. When we hear the, you know, all the journalists talking about this, the senior journalists and senior presenters in the BBC and, and, and other ones, paid an absolute fortune and then saying how marvellous the, the, these carers are, paid an utter pittance. You know, the, they, they cannot pay for food for their children. They can't pay for the mortgages for their houses if they have a living house they try and own. You know, with, with, the, with, the, with the pity and the claps from us wealthy people. Um, and that's just the same with climate change. It, you know, the climate change initially hits the poorer in our society. Do you think that's where, and I'm, I'm thinking of it from a sort of a communicator's point of view, of, is that where this, the new storytelling needs to go in our society, do you think? I mean, we are still clapping. There's a big sound of clapping every Thursday in our street here. And the chasm, if you like, between what that's, that achieves and what's re- in reality is not going to go away and when this passes most of us will sort of go back to some semblance of life before but really we do need to change that don't we i mean that is the well, crux of it I, I think we need to change it It depends on our, on our if you think inequality is wrong and this brings it to the fore then obviously we need to change it but i would also argue regardless of our moral or our political position if we think we need to deliver anything approaching our paris commitments then the maths and the science simply tell us we can't carry on with this levels of inequality from a climate change perspective alone we, we have to move away from this level of inequality until we, we can respond and move to zero carbon energy. And then we can go back to massive levels of inequality again. So in the short to medium term, inequality is, is, is incompatible with delivering our Paris Agreement. That just comes to the maths and the science tells us that. But once we've delivered on a zero carbon energy system, 
we can go back to massive levels of inequality. My guess is it will have huge sustainability implications and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think we have no choice if we respond to climate change to, to address the issues of inequality. And COVID-19 has brought them to the fore much more vividly than anything on climate change has done, at least within, within, within our own wealthy countries. We've seen the impacts of climate change impacting poor people elsewhere a long way away. And sadly, because they're not in our backyard, we don't care that much about them. But I still see, as I cycle, um, I, I said a lot of cycling. I was out cycling, I am quite a lot, lot of them, cycling through Cheshire. Um, and you see these huge mansions with signs that saying, well done, NHS. And this sort of thing, you are joking, aren't you? Do you ever use the NHS? Do your children go to private school? You drive around on the appalling quality of our roads and your huge um, four-wheel drives changed every two years. You don't, so you don't see the crumbling infrastructure around you because all the resources, and, and, and you already see this in Cheshire, it's awash with people having their mansions expanded or developed or a new pool put in there or a snooker room or whatever it might be. So there's a whole suite of construction work going on across the Cheshire mansions. And yet they're still there clapping for the NHS. And, and, and where are the journalists pointing this out? Well, the journalists are probably living there, some of them. Um, so there is a, and not all journalists, but certainly some of the more senior ones. So I think there is a problem that you're saying we need these story stories to be told, but who are the storytellers? The storytellers we've typically relied on live in those mansions. So we require a way, and maybe social media helps us here, we require a way that we're going to get new storytellers telling us new stories. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just the storytellers' st stories that need to be told, it's the new storytellers we require as well. And it's, um, it's interesting that <laughs> what you're basically saying is the inequality that we've seen because of the pandemic, you know, in our in our face, really, is actually solving that is also a sort of vaccine for, for our climate problems as well. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, uh, yes, yeah. I mean, I think yeah, I have to be quite careful on this. And I think we, so this is the point about us as academics and as activists. I have a particular set of political and social beliefs as a citizen mm -hmm. that I have to make sure or try my best, and undoubtedly will fail some of the time to not let overly influence my analysis or not let influence my analysis. But inevitably that I will fail to do that. I have, I have to reflect on that all the time. And I don't mean reflect once every month, think about it. I mean, think almost every day whenever I'm doing my work, am I, am I adjusting this for other sets of reasons that I'm reluctant to recognize myself? And it's incumbent on us academics to do that repeatedly. And it's not an easy process. And our colleagues need to do that themselves, but then also to each other. We need to do that. But I've come to the conclusion and others may disagree with that conclusion, but then, it, then I want to see their analysis to show why it's different. That actually it is the science and the maths that tell us that inequality is incompatible with delivering our Paris Agreement. Now, if we were happy with a four degree C future, then that inequality would be less of an issue. But if we were to need to deliver on a two degree C framing, I think the science and the maths tells us that inequality is incompatible with delivering on those, regardless of our moral or social positions. Okay, just a quick point to end on really is, in the past, in the, I remember in, in Bonn, you, you got up on stage with some of the climate scientists and people, and, and, and you, you used the term you know, climate glitterati. Can you just define your, your view there? The system that we, that we live within today does require, to some extent, to be legitimized or legitim legitim legitimated by, by academia. If academia is always pulling it apart, saying you know, this is wrong and that's wrong, then it's hard for the system to carry on surviving. And we see that, I mean, even in even simple examples of ones that people are more familiar with, or at least people of my age anyway, things like the Vietnam War. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the idea of the academics came out and uh, had their voices heard and the students and so forth was important in that, um, in catalyzing that change. The problem is now, I think, that we've been sufficiently co-opted at the senior level. So what we actually have are lots of climate scientists, mm -hmm. often, or of one form or another, um, asked to talk about mitigation to do reducing emissions. And the problem with the science in itself is like, it, it is almost um, apolitical. It doesn't have a, a direct political element to it, but mitigation is deeply political and it cannot be anything other than political. So it's an innate part of, miti of mitigation, you know, politi of the politics and political responses is an innate part of, 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 of mitigation. So as soon as scientists move across to say, well, what do we have to do about it? You become political. But then if you want to remain in, um, you know, um, with the, in the, sort of the, da the Davos, the, if you want to remain with that sort of glitterati element of our society, you have to become one of them. You've got to support their way of viewing the world. So you've got to go on about 
how can you, sol- you can solve it with technology, even though you probably have lots, I, mean, you know, I don't want to muddle up, science and technology are different things. A lot of scientists are absolutely appalling at understanding technology. They just simply think it's an extraction of, ex- an expansion or, or um, uh, extrapolation of their equations they use in science and how, how presto outcomes the technology. You know, it's a very, very different thing to that. You know, and also, it's not just that you have a technology that you design and invent, you've then got to implement it. And that itself is very different as well. And I think a lot of scientists are, 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 are very poor at that. And so there's this wonderful hope given in this sort of, uh, um, in this very sort of utopian technical future. And that, of course, feeds in, that allows us to maintain that, that inequality, that glitterati at, at every single level. Because we can just say rely on the technologists and the scientists will solve the problem in the future. And we can carry on as we are today. And we can feel ourselves as being part of the solution. But increasingly, it becomes evident that is failing. So eventually, it becomes to the point where you get some senior people. I mean, John Schellenhuber is a really very good example of a scientist who's prepared to speak out in quite strong terms. Um, and I think as we've, seen a, we've seen a change in John's attitude over time. And, and you know, he's, he's the sorts of voices that, that are very problematic for the glitter party because he's one of them. But actually, he is deeply critical of, of their framing of the debate. And I think we're so, slowly starting to see that with people like Johan Rockstrom as well. Um, but there are still plenty of other people out there who are deeply embedded in the sycophantic system um, and are reluctant to, to, to forego that prestige that they're, they're best, that's bestowed upon them when they massage the rest of the the system so i think eventually if you like what i'm saying with people like uh, and there are others out there as well but like rockstrom to some degree and and shannon hooper more so i think there are more of these people eventually they cannot continue to deny their own science and analysis it becomes very difficult to carry on doing that but it also doesn't require very many people i think to to start to question that from within that realm before others will start to collapse as well. So I think the dam could collapse quite quickly, mm-hmm. you like, and there's some hope in that. But it does require them to be pushed. So, you know, the, so we've got uh, Sean Huber and we've got Rockstrom, but we need the rest of us in the academic community and the civil society to be pushing the academics to be more honest. And that does require journalists to do that as well. Journalists have been terrible on probing over COVID. And I think they've been, they're really very bad on, on, on probing on climate change. They're also journalists and academics have been really bad at looking at system level issues. Mm-hmm. And that, that's true again about COVID and it's true about climate change. You, know, you, you realize how deeply embedded the reductionist way of thinking is. And that reductionist way of thinking also feeds into this nice sort of glitterati view of the world. When you stand back from it, look at the system, that's when you start to realize that actually we don't live in some sort of hierarchy, some pyramid where wonderful people sort of hand down their pearls of wisdom to the, to the swine beneath. That's not how the world works. We're starting to realize the world works because cleaners do what cleaners do, because carers do this, because delivery people do this, because shelf stackers do that. They are as important as surgeons, as, you know, as, as yeah. you know, professors and, and everyone else. So I think it's, uh, uh, it, what we've seen actually is reminding us that the system is important and it is not a hierarchical system. Okay, um, yeah. Thank you very much. My, my pleasure as ever, Nick. <laughs>